Okay. So what I understood from some people yesterday was you would like to work alongside of me in going through a structured determination. So um, I'm going to upload some files. We can't really do it until tomorrow. But, um, and you need to bring your laptops, obviously. So between today and tomorrow, get it set up so you can follow along, uh, preferably for me, from the command prompt. Um, do you know how to find the command prompt and put it on your desktop? Everybody has a PC, right? Not a Mac, a PC? Good. Um, command prompt, if, you, it, if you're running Windows 7, it's going to be in the list of programs. If you're running Windows 10, they kind of hide it. But you can find it. The command prompt is, is uh, executable, actually. It's cmd.exe. Oops. This is the command prompt. So I find it convenient to have it on the desktop or else in the taskbar so I can come to it quickly. And if you have any questions about setting that up, you can ask me or ask your friends. Um, but it is nice to have it right there so you can come to it. Next, um, I'm going to give you four programs. So there are XPrep. You may already have these programs. Um, XL, which is the latest Shell X. Uh, refinement program, XP, which is the molecular geometry program, is rather old. And let's see, what was the other one? Um, XL, XP, which one? All right, XT. OK. So. If there's a problem with downloading executables, I don't know what it is. But usually, we get around that by just changing the file extension to something and then changing it back to exe. Uh, certainly, when you email, you can't usually email an exe file. But anyway, these are the four main programs that we'll be using. I don't, I mean, you, you definitely are able to get these two on the Shellex homepage because those are open access. These two are much older programs, which I don't think there's really any problem you getting them. Um, and again, many of you may have them if you, if you put on the Brooker software on your, on your computer. OK, then there's another folder that has, I think, six different structures to solve. And if you want to just practice with those, they are not difficult structures. I didn't pick ones that have big disorder issues or anything like that. It's just an assortment of structures to solve, just to kind of get some practice, and um, I can then I'll pass out the solutions later. But meanwhile, all I'm giving you, the only information I'm giving you is I'm giving you the HKL, and then a text file, not a P4P file, but a text file that contains the um, chemical constituents, which atoms are present, and also I think the uh, the unit cell dimensions. That's basically all you really need to do it, right? You just need ABC, alpha, beta, gamma, HKL. So you can input those into XPREP. And then you, whatever you give for the atom types, it doesn't really matter too much. As long as you have each one represented that is expected to be there, that's usually good. And the number, in, number present, you can use that estimate of about 20 cubic angstroms per non-hydrogen atom if you want. Um, it, it turns out that that's really not that critical <laughs> that you have that in there. Not nowadays, anyway. OK, so there's, there's going to be like a text file and an HKL file for each of those six structures. Just enough to get you started and um, use your, your chemical intuition, look at thermal parameters, look at convergence and things like that to see if you can solve them with only that information. It's, it's a challenge in a way, but you know, again, uh, this program XT is so smart. It's probably going to identify most things correctly for you, except um, George Sheldrick would be the first to admit that it doesn't do a good job distinguishing between carbon and nitrogen, because it's really not that big of a difference between the number of electrons that they contain. And even oxygen sometimes is misidentified. And if, you know, usually it gets everything else pretty right. 
So you'll see the geometry, you'll see the shape, you should be able to figure it out. I mean, you're not getting graded, so just, just do it for fun. So I'm not going to go through any more structure solutions today, probably, because I want to wait until you get this set up. I recommend that you also um, create a, a directory for your x-ray stuff, you know, like maybe in the, in the root directory or if you have another main directory that you use, just call it x-ray or, or structures or something. And then uh, make subdirectories of that for each structure that you're working on. Um, you can either use the command prompt, remember that was MD, and then a name for a subdirectory. That's exactly the same as new folder, giving it a name. A new folder is actually a subdirectory. So this MD is what's going to make a subdirectory in, say you're, you're sitting here and the prompt is here. If you issue this command, it's going to make a subdirectory whatever name you want, usually the, the, the structure, okay? So that makes it easy to go in and out of directories and subdirectories if you do something like that. Uh, and you can also, depending on whether you have Windows 7 or Windows 10, it's, you can make the command prompt automatically go to, say, this directory. It's harder to do in Windows 10 for some reason. I'm sure there's some way to do it, but in Windows 7 it was very easy. Anyway, I, I can show you that tomorrow. But in the meantime, just, just download the stuff. There's some other interesting files there for you. There's a, a Shellex, Shellex manual. I, I can show you actually here. I think I have it here. Let me just minimize this for now. Um, yeah, I, I put them all in here, so it's easier. I just put them here. Oh no, I have that plugged in. Okay. Where did I put them? Oh, well, I'll sacrifice this for now. I think you're going to really like this one. There's a crystallographer at the University of Texas. Mm. His name is Joe Riebenspies. You may never have heard of him, but he's been around a long time. He's a pretty good programmer, actually. And he made this very cool PDF. It's called Shellex Manual Cards. And if you just open that, it has all of the Shellex commands like the ones that you would need in your INS file. And if you just click on it, it explains uh, what it does. So let's say um, HFIX. It's not quite as complete as the full manual, but it is a nice summary of what it does. And it's pretty much what I'm telling you anyway. So if you have this, you don't need me. It, it's really great. And then I also am giving you the user guide itself, this one, which was published by Sheldrick, and um, it has much more detail, but I like it, too. And if you get stuck, there's nothing like reading the manual, you know. <laughs> um, this file here is a reference sheet for XP, for using XP. And in addition to this, you have just the help feature. If you're in XP and you just type H-E-L-P, you also get this information. But these are the most common commands. And what else is in here? Um, yeah, again, there's structures to solve. So in, they're in here. There's one, two, three. Yeah, there's six of them. And um, the general instructions for, for going through the structure here. And then software is those, those four programs. I think I have that duplicated here. Let's see. <clears throat> I do. Okay, well, never mind. I'll take it out of here. Okay. So there's the software, a couple of PDFs from yesterday, and the Shel Sheldrick's um, XT publication from 2015. And this, maybe I'll add some more things to it, but there's some good websites that might be useful for you. Um, like, for example, if you have a 3D printer, 
Um, this is a website which allows you to convert your files to the, the type that you need to do 3D printing. Um, online Dictionary of Crystallography has a lot of the crystallographic terms in it. This uh, space group diagrams, you don't really need the international tables if you go to this website. I don't like it as well as the international tables, but it's cheap, it's free. <laughs> um, this is the IUCR CheckSIF site. And this is the Platon program, which also has CheckSIF. In fact, he wrote CheckSIF. Um, Idealized Molecular Geometry Library is really good for um, if you have disorder, and I'm going to spend some time teaching you about how to use this library to treat disorder. What it does is it gives you, the library gives you computational uh, geometries for common things that are rigid groups like perchlorate and PF6. And you can just take that whole group and paste it into your disordered molecule and it'll have all the idealized angles and uh, distances and you can just forget about it after that. It's, it's really easy. Um, I mean, that's usually a, part, a minor part of the structure that you don't really care about too much, but it's, it's a pain to deal with. If you paste in the idealist one and it, and it looks good, then you're going to have thermal parameters that are good. That's kind of the key. If it's not good, then you, the thermal parameters will blow up. OK. Then this is the main website for the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center, or CSD, as we usually call it. And this is the main website for IUCR, International Union of Crystallography. They have so many resources there also. So anyway, so there's this file in that folder, and you might find some of those things useful. Mm, those are the main things there. OK, so we're going to get these uploaded today, I hope. And uh, then we can you know, run through some structure solutions together starting tomorrow. But let's go to just some other notes that I have here for you. Okay, um, I need to run that. Okay, so again, let me, let me just run quickly through. <laughs> um, we keep doing this, but the steps to solving a structure. Like I've written, it's not necessarily in this order. Like you could add hydrogen atoms before the list number five in this. It, it just depends. But initially, you want to find all the non-hydrogen atoms. And if you see, the thing about finding hydrogens is you usually need an R value of 5% or less to really, really locate hydrogens in a difference map. Sure, you could add them. But if you want to really see, like if a nitrogen really has a hydrogen on it, it's really good to get your R value down. And adding the hydrogens gets it down, yes, but not as fast as a larger atom. So you might want to go ahead and make those atoms anisotropic, but you also have the option of doing it later. It doesn't matter that much. Okay. Also, I recommend that you try to get the molecule kind of moved over and up or whatever you need to do to get it in the middle of the unit cell. The unit cell, the basic unit cell being the one that goes from zero to one in uh, crystallographic coordinates in each of the three directions. It doesn't matter in the Fourier calculation if it's in that unit cell or not. It's, the other options are just translations, but it looks better, just prettier, and it's easier to make a plot, too, if you want to do a graphic, to have it in the unit, in the middle. Uh, you will get an, a complaint when you run CheckSIF if it's not in the middle. Um, and XP is actually very useful for moving everything into the middle, and I suppose some of the other softwares are too. Um, I know that they exist. So there's more than one way to do that, or you can also just do it by brute force. <laughs> okay, so adding hydrogen atoms, I want to go over that a little more today. These uh, need to be updated. The unit statement, which is the number of atoms in the unit cell of each type, um, the LST file will give you some keys about that. Temp, get temp in there as early as possible because it influences the distance that's used for the default carbon-hydrogen distances. That's a, it's, it's a function of temperature. So if you put it in the file, it's going to use the right temperature. And remember, that's in degrees Celsius. Okay. 
So if you're using a cryostat, the number will be negative. Room temperature, usually 23 or 25 or something like that. Okay, and size also should be in there because when you do run the ACTA command to get the SIF file, it's going to make use of the size command to estimate the uh, transmission or absorption. And if you don't want to have to calculate that yourself, it, it, it'll be automatically calculated. So there's size and then followed by just three numbers in millimeters. Okay. Um, yeah, again, intermolecular interactions, you might want to adjust the positions, relative positions of the groups in your structure so that you emphasize those interactions. It looks much better. Um, so the graphic handling thing is, is painful in a way, but it's also the beautiful part of crystallography. So we will do a little more of that. And I want to do some stuff with SIF too, towards the end, and checking. And uh, when you want to take your crystal structure to your PI and say, here, you know, this is what I did, make sure that he or she can see what you did. You know, the graphics are important and really important in a publication. So that's all part of understanding the structure, is explaining that. How to, how to move it? Um, okay, you always can move by unit translations, right? So there's a command in, um, in the ins file that you can put in to just do that, if that's all you want to do, like slide it over to the next unit cell over, which could be either positive or negative. Um, so if you put in the, something like move, and then the three things that you want to translate or not translate, followed by one more term, which is whether you want to invert it or not. Okay. Um, so suppose you just wanted to, you saw that your, all of your x coordinates were bigger than one, let's say 1.3333 or something like that. And you want to move it back to 0.3333. You would just put in minus one. And then if the others are okay, you can just say zero, zero. And with no inversion, one, if you want to invert the structure, which obviously happens a lot if you have a chiral structure or a non-center symmetric structure, uh, usually then you would want to do something like 1, 1, 1, minus 1, so that you invert it, but you keep it in the same unit cell. So you're not just going negative, but you're keeping it within the same unit cell. But then you look at what you got afterwards. So you put this command in, run a refinement cycle. Th these commands won't still exist. They will not be there, but your parameters will be shifted. And if you don't remember what I wrote, you can go to that PDF file that I showed you that Joe Rebenspies wrote. Click on move, he'll explain it. It's, okay, so that's one way to do it. Now, it turns out that for many space groups, you can also move by a half, <laughs> and it won't hurt anything. Um, which ones it works for, it depends on which, which space group it is, but you often can just also use a half instead of a one or a minus one here. Um, so that's something else to try. And then the other thing is to actually, actually specify the, the, um, the um, general position that you want to use, plus or minus trans, uh, translation. Um, now this dates back to ORTEP. You've all heard of ORTEP, I'm sure. So Oak Ridge thermal ellipsoid plots were developed at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory many years ago. And there was a methodology developed at that time for making ORTEP drawings. And maybe I should go over that. And, maybe not right now, but it's uh, actually still used quite a bit, and it's a way of designating the symmetry, the symmetry operations that you're using. They are incorporated into XP in a really nice way, and I really like it because I feel like I have control. You know, I can move molecules however I want using the general positions. Any general position that you use, you get the same calculation, so it doesn't matter. That's what, they, what, that's what that means, general position. Okay. Does that answer your question? <laughs>
uh, we'll talk about that a little more when we do some actual uh, structure solutions. I think you'll see. Okay, so a little bit more about the commands. There's the l.s. command. That stands for least squares. N is how many cycles of least squares you want to do. With today's fast computers, you can really do 12 or you can do 24. Uh, we used to say, if it doesn't converge in four cycles, then it's, something's wrong. But actually, sometimes it does take 24 cycles to converge. What you do is you, you again, we'll do this one in the practice, but you keep an eye on the shifts. And the last shift should be like 0 0.005 or, or less, 001. That means it's converged. So you keep an eye on the shifts. Um, it's up to you how many cycles you want to do. You can set it to 8, 12. Um, it doesn't have to be an even number even anymore. It used to have to, but it doesn't now. And if it's 0, that's useful too sometimes. So it's only doing the structure factor calculation. If it's 0, it's not actually doing the refinement. So there's no partial derivatives involved. It's simply the calculation. Um, yeah, least squares procedure is used in economics and lots of other fields. And you, you all are so good in math, I'm sure you know what that is. So you're, just, you're taking your variables, just considering them to be partial derivatives and setting up these matrices. And yeah, it's, it's, it's hairy, but it's kind of intuitive too. If you put in fmap2, there's a difference map going to be calculated. There's other if map, cho if map choices, like 3 is just a Fourier calculation without difference. Um, again, you can look at those Shellex cards and see what the different options are. Most common is fmap2. That usually gives you the best uh, output that you can interpret. And immediately following that, or, or not, it doesn't actually have to be immediately following it, plan. So how many, and M, how many uh, Q peaks you're going to get. So they'll be listed at the end of the res file in the order strongest to weakest. Uh, default is 20, so if you don't say anything, you'll get 20 Q peaks. If you want 50, just say plan, space, 50, etc. And what a lot of people don't realize is uh, if you are running ACTA, in other words, you want to output the SIF, the default is fmap to plan 20. You don't need to say it again. Just say ACTA. OK? Um, yeah, so look at the Q-peaks and see, again, you know, those are pretty much scaled to this to z, the number of electrons, that kind of z, the atomic number. So if you see a z of four, or a Q-peak that has a height of 14, it's not, it's not carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen. It's something bigger maybe chlorine or something like that. So yeah, and if it's less than one, it could be hydrogen or it could just be kind of spurious, not real garbage. <laughs> um, if it's around, usually the, the uh, SIF checking programs look to see if there's anything greater than one that's left over at the end. Um, but just if I would say initially deal with anything that looks to be over, the, over one and then consider the rest to be potential hydrogens or nothing. OK. Good advice. All right. <laughs> now, how do you tell the difference between carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen? Um, there's two main things, bond distances and thermal parameters. So you should have, by now, a feeling for covalent radii. And if you don't, certainly they're tabulated everywhere. and then. So see if they're reasonable. Oxygen has a smaller covalent radius than carbon, right? They get smaller as you go from left to right across the row. Um, displacement parameters. So if the U value seems to be too low, then it might be a heavier atom. It's kind of the, the uh, inverse. If, it's, if the U value is too high, then it should be a lighter atom. I'll show you a picture that sort of illustrates that. And then if you've, if you've changed the atom type, you have to do it in the SFAC to look at the SFAC order, too. Don't forget to do that, remember? Because carbon is 1. Let's say oxygen might be 3. So if you're changing it from carbon to oxygen, you've got to change that second uh, character in the list to 
two or three. Okay. So here's a, an old picture I drew just to kind of illustrate this size argument. Um, in the left side, you see a central atom that was named strontium. And you see the thermal parameters really big compared to the rest. And the rest also don't look too pretty because they're pretty, uh, what do you say, skewed, you know, not, not very isotropic looking. And then on the right hand side, that atom was changed to magnesium, and this S vac correspondingly changed. And that is the correct uh, atom. I knew it was anyway, I just did this to show you. And you look at, you know, sure, the thermal parameter for magnesium looks small compared to the rest, but that's also because it's the center of the libration. Remember, it's librating around the heaviest atom. So, but the remainder look, they look good. There's not a huge variation. And certainly the R value dropped a lot from 0.111 to 0.024. So you have both of these confirmations. And then, you know, the third one would be looking at the bond distances, um, that you made the right choice with, it, with that. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, there was a, an error that I really liked where a student picked some uh, bottle off the shelf and it was actually mercury, but it was HG and it wasn't written very well. And it actually should have been silver. <laughs> so we had a hard time figuring out the structure until we realized, oh, actually it was silver. So, you, you know, sometimes you need to do that kind of thing. Okay, so what about the hydrogen, adding the hydrogen atoms? Um, in, unless you have this super duper data set like helium data or something like that, you should not worry about uh, refining the hydrogen atoms that are bonded to carbon. Do refine the hydrogen atoms that are bonded to potential donor atoms like oxygen with an OH or nitrogen with an NH. Those might be donating <coughs> and making hydrogen bonds. But hydrogens in a fennel ring, they're uninteresting. Besides, we know already that the CH distances are too short because they're x-ray data. So you might as well just add them geometrically and let them refine that way. And you don't add any extra parameters also if you do that, especially if you allow the thermal parameter to be related to the bonded atom. And that's usually the way it's done. I'll show you that in a sec. So um, yeah, that's basically all that says. So again, I mean, there are many ways that you could find them. You could look for them in a difference map, but then you have to go to the trouble of naming them and sorting them and you know, putting them in where they go. Or you can do it automatically. Um, in XP, there's an automatic method for adding hydrogens called HAD. And it does a pretty good job. Sometimes it will make a mistake. Like if your fennel ring is a little disordered, it might add two hydrogens instead of one to a carbon. And um, it often adds hydrogens to nitrogen atoms that shouldn't be there, or hydrogens to oxygens that shouldn't be there. But it's a quick and dirty way of adding the hydrogens. You can you know, project it, look at the structure, and see if it did it right. The other way is to do it uh, atom by atom. And this is really only easy if you've sorted your atoms, you've num numbered them in some sequential way, you know, like going around a fennel ring or something like that. And then um, you don't have to make too many of these lines, but you can use the hfix command as one of the commands in the INS file and specifically say what kind of hydrogen you want to add. So there's, uh, again, you know, the manual is really useful for figuring out how to do this. But the most common ones are 4,3 for, uh, you know, like a phenyl hydrogen. So you would just say hfix 4,3 space and then name the atoms that you want to have a hydrogen added, okay? Or if you have a sequence, much easier. You might say something like hfix 4,3 C1 and then a space greater than space C6. So that would like add hydrogens to a benzene ring, right? But in, the, in your file, you better have it in that order. You know, you've got to have C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, 
C6. Because if it's not in that exact order, then it will, it'll just start here and then it'll add, try to add hydrogens to everything right after that. But yeah. So that's a really good argument for naming systematically and sorting. I know it's a pain, but um, really it's better if you do. Um, and then you, can, you don't have to do just those in one line, you can do a space, and you know maybe you have another atom that's by itself. You could put just C8, C20, and so on. You can make it a long line as long as you don't exceed 80 characters. So everything that you list in that line will have a hydrogen added, one hydrogen added to it. And then, looking over there, you can see uh, tertiary, secondary, methyl, methyl. And then there's some other options too, but those are the most common ones. Yeah, okay, that, I knew you'd ask that. Next slide. <laughs> okay, here's the difference. <clears throat> you can read this. So um, they're both going to be added um, as isotropic, with isotropic thermal parameters set to 1.5 times the equivalent isotropic thermal parameter of the bonded carbon. So that's like <clears throat> and let's say that, that this carbon has a, a thermal parameter of, of 0 0.02 then in the in the line it's going to say um, you know C say, say this is C1, C1 space space one, it's X, Y, Z, and an 11 for the site occupation factor, and then 0 0.02. Can you still see that? I mean, I should move it up. Um, yeah, so after that, after your C1, there's going to be an affix 4, 3, or sorry, Either 3-3 three, three or 1-3-7. If it's 3-3, three, three, it would look like this. And then the X, Y, Z. And the site occupation factor. And then the thermal parameter would be written as minus 1.5. And there'll be H2 or H1, B2, blah, 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 minus 1.5. And H. 1C, 2. So that actually doesn't use any extra parameters because um, these are just computed and set as a rigid bond that's attached to the carbon. And however the carbon moves, the hydrogen moves with it. It's called riding. And these are just also tied to whatever the uh, thermal parameter was for the carbon. So that's another reason to do it this way. It doesn't add any extra parameters. And we'd want to keep the number of parameters low so that we get a good data to parameter ratio. So that's, and then the, finally there will be an affix zero. If you, if you don't do this syntax correctly, then you'll get an error message when you do the refinement. So then you have to figure out what did you do wrong? Did you forget to put in the affix zero or something like that? Okay, the difference between 3.3 three and 137. Um, 137 is preferred if your data will uh, allow it. It has to be pretty good data. But here's the difference. So with HFIX33, the group is staggered with respect to the shortest other bond. So um, the way that, that the three hydrogens are set depends on what it's bonded to here. Uh, but it doesn't work if it's um, an acetonitrile because there's no um, Acetonitrile, because it's straight, it, it doesn't know how to set that that angle there. So with acetonitrile, you have to use HFIX137. HFIX and I usually start out with HFIX137 and see if it, if it converges OK. Because what it does is it sets the three hydrogens as a rigid group together, rotates the whole group together until it settles in to where it should be and it's definitely a more elegant method than this. This is just an assumption, but this is actually the true location. So, um, 
You could, you could start out with one and switch it to the other. It doesn't really matter. Um, but that's the difference. Well, some programs are going to use the default of hfix 3.3 for some reason. So then you need to go and change it to 137 and see, see what happens. Okay, so another uh, piece of information that you're often asked about is the goodness of fit. And this is the goodness of fit, it's how it's calculated. Uh, it is said that it should be close to one, but I rarely ever see that it's close to one. And to tell you the truth, I wouldn't worry about it too much. But this is actually uh, part of the um, things that are looked at during refinement to get a good goodness of fit. And it, the, what really affects it is the weight. So the weight is a term here in it. N is the number of reflections, and P is the number of parameters. So again, the goodness of fit looks, looks gooder, looks better if you have more parameters, more uh, data than you have parameters. So keep that in mind. Uh, people focus an awful lot on R1, but this is also kind of the idea. OK, so coming back to this ordering here, after the carbon, whatever the carbon is that has a hydrogen on it, there's going to be some kind of affix after that, then the hydrogen positions, then an affix 0. And it'll be in, in some kind of order, like I'm showing here. OK, so again, sorting the list. Um, suppose you wanted to calculate a dihedral angle between two six-membered rings. You can do that in the INS file in an easy way. If you, yeah, if they're in order, so C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7 is one six-membered ring, and C8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 is another six-membered ring. So what the program does, this is, these are lines in the, in the INS file. It will um, compute the normal to that plane, normal to the other plane, put those normals at common origin, and calculate the angle between them. So that's what we mean by the dihedral angle. And occasionally, that's the sort of thing that you want to report. So if you want to get this with a standard uncertainty, so you can put something in parentheses, <laughs> You have to do it during the refinement because it's part of the least squares procedure. So the result will end up in the LST file. You can look at it in the LST file and quote it if you need it. There's some other things that you can do. I um, didn't write it here, I don't think. No. One more along those same lines. Something that I like to use a lot is RTAB. And again, this, all of these things are in that program, that PDF that I told you about. But it allows you to compute distances that you might not, other, not, might not otherwise compute as part of the least squares procedure. So you specify them here, the ones that you want. You can also do angles, and you can also do torsion angles this way. So if you wanted, say, an angle, it, it always starts with R tab, and then there's a second term, um, like um, bond. <laughs> and then you would name sets of two atoms that you want to compute, like, say, copper 1, um, O1, copper 1, O2. So Sometimes you have long uh, copper metal, di uh, copper atom distances, ligand distances. So you could sp specify those, and then they will be output with standard uncertainties. Or if you want to do angles, you could give three things. I think you can just use three characters there. So it could be, you know, like N1, C1, C2, or something like that, and it'll give the angle. Um, about C1, or you can do, um, what was the other thing I was saying, confirmations, you can do that too. So just 
if there's four terms here, then you, you calculate that. Okay. So all those, those there's sort of, yeah, fine tuning, fine tuning of the whole procedure of solving a structure. Okay, so let me, since we're not solving a structure yet, because I want you to get your computers set up to do that and bring them bring next time, let's go to the beginning of the next lecture, which was here. <clears throat> Why isn't it showing me the bottom? <laughs> I hear this. Not that used to this computer yet. Let's try it again. Well, there must be some way to run it, right? know where it is. Find files. One of these things. No, 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 no. I know, I'm opening the PDF. That's the problem. Sorry. <laughs> That's why you can't run it. Let's try that again. No, this is not right. Okay, must be in the wrong directory. Okay, I apologize. Here we go. So some non-covalent bonding things that you could look for in your in examining your results. Okay. Um, Van der Waals radius is important when you're talking about non-covalent bonding or non-classical bonding or whatever you want to call it. Um, and again, you can look these up. They're also uh, in the library of XP, so that's a really quick way to look them up. I'll show you that later. Um, so the covalent radii, you know, those are the bonds, but the things that are kind of interesting are the non-covalent interactions. <coughs> and they vary pretty widely. So it's a good idea to think about that. If you want to understand packing, you really need to know these and think about those. The uh, van der Waals radii for noble gases aren't reliable, so don't forget, don't worry about those. <laughs> so the idea is that it's attractive, it's structure directing, but it's not a strong bond. It's a weak interaction. <clears throat> Under the kind of broad category of dispersive interactions, but then there's hydrogen bonding, pi pi interactions, all kinds of things like that. Um, dispersive interactions often involve a lot of hydrogens or other things. Oh. What you see, there's indications for the non-covalent bonding are things like properties, melting point, boiling point. That's you know classic gen general chemistry stuff explaining why water has a higher boiling point than hydrogen sulfide, say. Um, the di directionality in the crystal structure may be uh, influenced by this. So what kinds are there? There's dipole-dipole interactions, donor-acceptor, weak covalent, electrostatic, etc. cetera. Uh, hydrogen bond, some people call electrostatic, but some people don't. Uh, 
let's just leave it at that. <laughs> but you look for a, a, an interaction that's like, like this one here. So X is the donor, H is the X hosts the donor. The donor is the hydrogen and Y is the acceptor. So we call this a hydrogen bond. <clears throat> and the energetics of that bond vary widely. The typical is, I would say, around maybe 12 kilojoules per mole, something like that. But the hydrogen bond in this species is really strong. It's estimated to be um, 163 kilojoules per mole. And the hydrogen is very much centered between the two atoms. And it's a very linear hydrogen bond. But most hydrogen bonds are not linear. The angle is usually 165 degrees, something like that. And um, of course, the hydrogen is closer to one side than the other most of the time, but sometimes it's really close to being in between. So here's some really simple examples of hydrogen bonds. I'm sure I don't really need to tell you about these. This weak kind of hydrogen bond is often also ca characterized in a structure. Yeah, okay, so viscosity is influenced by hydrogen bonding. Here's a, a nice example. This was a structure I did of aspartic acid. And it's the racemic mixture. It's not in a single enantiomer. But you, you see it can form as a spitter ion here. And the, the hydrogens up on here are pretty acidic. So you should look for hydrogen bonding here. And definitely, the first hydrogen bond that was found is really is very short. Um, this Usually, you at least look at the O1A to O4 distance, which is usually around 2.7. But if you see one that's 2.4, you're approaching very strong hydrogen bonds. And the more linear this is, the stronger the hydrogen bond. In this case, 176.4 yeah, degrees. And the O1A, O4 distance is 2.5. So they're very correlated. The shorter the, shorter the donor and acceptor large atoms are, the more linear the bond. You always see that. Now there's a second hydrogen bond here that's forming a different motif. Um, there's quite a bit of literature about describing those, but I don't want to go into that, <laughs> those motifs. But they actually, because they are um, cooperative, those, those types of interactions are also very strong in structure directing. They're cooperative because they're occurring simultaneously. It's like in the carboxylic acids where you have hydrogen bonding both directions. So it turns out that there's even more hydrogen bonds here. So this one is really intricate and you can have a lot of fun drawing that picture. There's actually four distinct hydrogen bonds in that structure. And, you know, hydrogen bonding in amino acids is clearly very, very important. So this is not just an off offhand observation. It's important. OK, another kind of cool hydrogen bonding is in the gas hydrates. Do you know about these gas hydrates? They're found off in the ocean, deep masses in the ocean. And they actually contain uh, a cage structure with methane inside. And as we have more and more global warming, that methane is getting released and making the global warming worse because the methane is going into the atmosphere. So like in the Arctic, where a lot of those um, ice flows are melting, these gas hydrates are being released too, falling apart, giving off methane. I think they're really cool. I didn't have a picture of one, unfortunately. I should have. Um, yeah, I've, I've mentioned the pi pi interactions with fullerenes before. So you can have face to face interactions of aromatic groups with fullerenes. And, but you can also have edge to face. So remember that the, the hydrogen in a phenyl ring is 
partially positive, has a, tends to have a positive charge. And the center of a, a fennel ring tends to be partially negative. So this is another kind of interaction that structure directing, you can see both edge-to-face and face-to-face -face interactions. And here's the host-guest interaction with C60, which I really like. And here's another one that was described as the Bucky Catcher, where this, this interesting molecule here is actually curved, naturally curved, and it was proposed, obviously, that it would catch a C60, and it does. It's a very nice structure. And this is a structure that I, I want to go through with you tomorrow, if possible, that has a very strong intramolecular hydrogen bond. And then, in addition, it has some intermolecular hydrogen bonds not shown here. That's a nice example of solving a structure, and we'll do that one tomorrow. And to get the hydrogen bonds, let's just make this the last slide. Um, this is a new version in Excel, so you, if you don't have a new version, you're not going to use this. <coughs> if in the final cycles of refinement you have ACTA and HTAB, then you do the refinement and at the end of the rest file all of the hydrogen bonding interactions are set up for you so you don't have to figure them out yourself and they can be hairy to figure out. So for example, at the end of that rest file you get this list right here. So instructions for potential hydrogen bonds and the only ones that I considered I think were the ones that were involving oxygen and oxygen donor and acceptor. Like the last two, those are those are non-classical hydrogen bonds, probably weak, very, very weak, maybe important. But anyway, you just take this cut and paste, put it back at the top, and in the output, it's going to list the uh, correct syntax for this, which is always, you know, first you have the donor, then you have the acceptor, and the uh, distances are all listed here. Yeah, I, I omitted those. And if, if it doesn't make a, a reasonable hydrogen bond, then the output will tell you it's no, not suitable. <laughs> Which may be because of some error that you made or might be actually true, so that's something to check. All right, so let's, let's continue this. I have a lot more to tell you about things to look at in structures, but let's try to get this set up so we can do the um, stuff in class. And it's going to slow us down a lot. I know from experience that waiting for people to get up to speed with everybody else takes a while, so I hope you'll be patient. Uh, if it's really too slow, then we won't do it, but we can give it a try. And you know, I'd like to work with you and get you going on this. So, sound okay? Hopefully they'll get uploaded today. So see me about that, doing that, please. Okay.